action. We're good? All right, again, good morning to all who are here and all who may be listening to this at some point. Pray that it will bless you. Let's go before the throne of grace. Because, oh, Father, we wouldn't begin to try to study Your Word without Your gracious Spirit, the author of that Word, to be here with us. Holy Spirit, we ask You individually and corporately to be here with Your great presence, to bring Your knowledge, Your wisdom, Your direction into our lives as we study this magnificent Word. Pray, Lord, that our hearts will be open to receive the kingdom principles that You want to show us this day. There won't be just some teaching that we forget ten minutes from now, but, Lord God, just something we incorporate into our very lives. So we thank You, sir. We yield to You. Bless us with Your Word, Lord God. We will bless Your Word with our attention. And we thank You for that. In Jesus' name, Amen. Well, in our study of Mark's Gospel, we see the great importance that Jesus places in the training of the twelve apostles. That He has chosen to be the witness of His words and of His deeds to the world. We have seen Jesus leave Galilee and the multitudes that followed Him to strike out deep into Gentile regions where He would have more uninterrupted time to spend with these men and on their education. In reading these accounts, you certainly have to admire the fortitude of Jesus' patience with these men. There are times, quite honestly, when you listen to these guys and you think, are they ever going to get it? So many times they seem to repeat the same failures or they simply fail to learn. And it makes you want to say, Jesus, I know you know what you're doing. You personally picked these twelve. But sometimes they are not the sharpest tool in the box. The event that we will study today is certainly a confirmation of what I've just said. You'll look at this event today and you're going to Look at their response and you're going to wonder if any of these guys are ever going to make it. If there's any hope for these guys. But actually everything that I'm sharing with you right now came after the teaching was done. I had already written out the teaching, prayed about it, studied, did my thing. And the Spirit spoke to me about this. So there was a a whole new beginning to this teaching. Because what the Spirit said to me was this. It is hard to change a culture, hard to tear down thoughts and imaginations. Now this, of course, as it would for anybody, took me to Paul's second letter to the Corinthian church where he said this, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, for pulling down strongholds, I abbreviate it a little bit, but pulling down of strongholds, thoughts, and imaginations. Now we're all familiar with these words and it's normal to apply these truths to those who are outside the kingdom. To those who, uh, words of spiritual warfare for those who come against the truth of God. But what the Spirit was showing me is that these words can also apply to a spiritual warfare that sometimes rages within the believer. Like the apostles, see if you agree with this. Like the apostles, when Jesus calls us to himself, he knows we come with baggage. Every one of us come to Christ with baggage that can best be described as strongholds, thoughts, and imaginations. It is difficult to change preconceived ideas, especially when we imagine them to be true. We all come to God with a certain preconceived theology. It has been said that perception is reality, whether that perception is true or not. What we imagine to be true is true. What we imagine to be true is the verdict of our hearts. What we imagine to be true is the verdict of our hearts. We have already passed judgment on a thought in our heart. And what we have imagined to be true now becomes a stronghold. No one dealt with false, inform- false imagination more than the prophet Jeremiah. In Jeremiah's scroll, letter, whatever you want to call it, seven times he admonished Israel for their false imaginations, and each time the word imagination is translated stubbornness. 
So seven times he speaks for God to the nation. He says, you're stubborn, you're stubborn, you're stubborn, you're stubborn. Seven times he says to the nation, you are stubborn. Holding on stubbornly to a thought because we have judged it to be true. It's hard to change preconceived ideas. Hard to change those thoughts and behaviors. It takes time. From our perspective, we could ask... How did Jesus put up with these hard-headed, undiscerning disciples? But from his perspective, there is an understanding that to change an ingrained culture takes time. From his perspective, they, like all of us, were products of their culture, their heritage, and their traditions. And that doesn't change overnight. Truth may be taught, truth must be taught and consistently reinforced until the stronghold has been pulled down. All of us know that's true. All of us have come to Christ with certain preconceived ideas or we came out of denominations with preconceived ideas and we had to do a lot of rethinking and it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy for me to become a non-Lutheran. It was probably not easy for Ben to become non-Amish or any of you and what your backgrounds are. I was vividly reminded of this last, last time I taught at the prison, one of the last times I taught there. I don't remember what my initial teaching was, but it ended up with an explanation or an exhortation of the priesthood of the believer and that there is no longer any office of the priest in the gift ministries to the church. You're all aware of that. Jesus gave gifts to the church. What? Apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists. We do not see, after thousands of years of having a priesthood, we do not see the priesthood given as an office to the church because God in His infinite wisdom and His infinite grace wanted His whole body to become a a royal priesthood to him. And he has expounded on that with me in these last couple of weeks because I, I always knew we were his sheep, but I never put it together that we are the temple sheep. We are the perfect sheep. We are the spotless sheep. We must be, because think about it, just, just think about this, because the Bible says that we are to present ourselves to God, a living sacrifice, which is our reasonable service as his priesthood. As the priesthood, we make sacrifice. What is the sacrifice? Ourselves. Why, why is it proper that we can give ourselves to God as a living sacrifice? For he has has made us holy. He has made us without spot or blemish or any such thing. And when, think of the wonder of that. Think, think about how if you were, if, if, if those friends of yours that want to insist, well, we're just sinners saved by grace, then how could I present something sinful, something dirty to God as a royal priesthood? What I give to God must be perfect as He is perfect. Otherwise, I would need to be under some kind of blood because it wouldn't be right. But I've already been under the blood. And because of the blood, we are holy and we are perfect perfect before God and we offer ourselves to him daily as a living holy sacrifice well when I was done with that teaching I had an older man come up to me he said I'm gonna pray for you and I thought fantastic I always love it when somebody says I'm gonna pray for you take all the prayers I can get you would too take all the prayers we can get right but then the spirit quickened me that this man was a Roman Catholic and I had attacked one of his strongholds And he wasn't so much praying for me as he was praying that God would straighten me out. So the question is, will we allow the spirit of truth to change any imaginations in us that may be contrary to the word? Are we willing to hold our theology up against God's theology and make any necessary changes? And you come down to it, that's what we do every Sunday. Every Sunday we come in here, having been in the world, having done what we needed to do for the last seven days. And we've all had forces trying to get us to conform to the world, to change our thinking. And I don't know about you, but I come to church to be renewed. I come to have my thinking renewed. I come to be transformed from the conformity that Satan would want me to take on the world. So, so we do this all the time. As Christians, we always take what we think against what the Word of God says. I know my mother-in-law at one time years ago got mad at me about something and the only thing I could tell her was I was standing on God's word and I just told her, I said, you know, mom, I said, I love you, but it really doesn't matter what you think. And I said, it really doesn't matter what I think. The only thing that matters is what does God think? And that's the way we need to be. And we need to be willing to challenge that. You know, I, 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 I get fed up with religious people that get set in their ways and they become unteachable. It is amazing how once new wineskins become old and brittle and can't take new wine. 
I want new wine till the day I die. I want new wine till that day or the rapture, and then I'm going to have new wine for eternity, and so will you. But I think we always have to be willing. Because you see, the, the problem is the ingrained beliefs of these 12 apostles that make what we're going to talk about today important. So again, are we willing to hold our theology up against God's theology and make necessary changes? Will we reject our imagined truth when confronted with God's truth? And will we be as patient as Jesus was with these apostles? Will we be as patient with those or with ourselves and with others Truth must be spoken in love and consistently enforced. Making, disip- making disciples takes time. So are, are you being a little bit patient with yourself? You're not going to change overnight. It's the old saying goes, Rome wasn't built in a day. But we're, cons- you know, and we might think, because I know all of you have walked with the Lord for a long time, so have I. But you know what? I still got so much to learn. So much to learn. So many changes probably that still need to be made. And some of you know what it's like to try to go back to relatives that are locked into something and you know they're not getting the truth and they, they don't even understand their salvation. They don't understand what salvation really is. It's not that we're saying they're unsaved, but there's so much more for them. And you know how hard it is because ingrained truths are hard to come against. I have a cousin that I love dearly. He's now 83, I think he told me the other day. And he wants to, wants to, wants to learn things so bad and when he first started talking to me about things, he broke into the religious mode. I didn't. And he, he started asking me a lot of questions. He's staunch Lutheran. He started asking me a lot of questions, and I started giving him straight answers. And at first it offended him. And now he comes back for more. And yet it's hard. I, I see so many things. The man is 83 years old, loves the Lord, and just really doesn't know a whole lot. That's where I was. That's where a lot of you were at one time. And you know how hard it is, even particularly within families, to change an ingrained behavior or an imagination that has become truth to somebody. It takes time. So, with that in mind, having laid that groundwork, let's look at today's lesson. Most of us are familiar with the Great Commission. Let me read it to you very quickly, end of Matthew. Then Jesus spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. Most of us are very familiar with the words of the Great Commission that Jesus gave his disciples at the end, at the time of his ascension, rather, into heaven. We have become so used to these words that I've just read that we can fail to understand the dynamic of what Jesus was saying. To take truth taught into all the world and to do so under his authority. Can you imagine if Jesus had not prepared these men and simply on the last time that they would physically see him until they went to heaven, to hear him say these words, that Jesus would give this command of this magnitude, of this dynamic, and then leave. How confused and I don't know what you would have called it to have given to, you know, look at where they're at right now. If Jesus right now were writing our story, gave him this command, they wouldn't know what to do with it. So he couldn't just, you can imagine how, how confused they would have been if he had done that, but instead he didn't dump on them and just walk away. Now a big part of that preparation was to take them, as we've seen, deep into the Gentile regions. And in the 8th chapter of Mark, he records the last great event that is going to happen in this region of the Gentiles. Jesus is on his way back to Israel. Jesus is on his way back to Jerusalem. He is coming back, you know, his death is getting closer and closer, and he's working his way back. This is the last time he will go into the Gentile regions. And this is an event that will happen, this is the last last great event that will happen in this region of the Gentiles. This This is the event that will end the Gentile journey. This event, once again, reinforces to the twelve that God is determined and his determined will to include the Gentile into his kingdom. If this were not God's pre-pro, pre, pre, 
purposed will. If this was not the pre-purposed, pre-purposed will of God, then the Great Commission would have sent them only to the house of Jacob rather than the world. John the Baptist would have told his disciples, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of Israel. John 3.16 would say that God so loved Israel that he gave his only begotten Son. But sadly, that is how the people of Jesus' day saw it. That's how they heard it. Even when John said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, what they heard was, Behold the Messiah that takes away the sin of Israel. Everything was about Israel, and they couldn't picture the world. This is how they were trained to believe. This is their imag- what their imagination had become a stronghold, and they stubbornly held to it. In light of this, Jesus makes an astounding statement. In those days, the multitude being very great, and having nothing neat, they're starting to pick up uh, you know, uh, people as they start to leave the, the Gentile regions. In those days, the multitude being very great, and having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said to them, I feel compassion. I don't know what translation you might be using. Even the New King James has got this one wrong. This is what it literally says in the Greek. If your Bible does that, I'm telling you, the, the whole teaching today is based on those three words. So if your Bible doesn't say it, please write it in the margin of your Bible or in your notes. Jesus says, I feel compassion for the multitudes because they have now been with me three days and have nothing to eat. Why is that such an astounding statement that Jesus says, I feel compassion? Because it's the only time he ever said it. (gasps) You can't be serious, Pastor. Jesus was full of compassion. But this is the only time in the first person singular that he ever says this. It's not in Matthew, Mark, or, or, Luke, or Matthew, John, Luke. It is right here. And this is the only time, the only time in his ministry that he says these words. He says, I feel compassion. A very interesting statement when we understand it is only the place in the four Gospels that Jesus says this. He says this in the first person singular. Hard to believe. The Gospels make many references to Jesus' compassion. All record that he felt compassion, but this is the only time that he says personally for himself, I feel compassion. All others are an assumption by his behavior. But what he did, uh, but, but by what he did, not because of what he said. So this is the only time that he has said, and the, and the Greek word that is used here is the word splenashinosomy. It's a hard word to pronounce. But it means, in the Greek, the word he chose to use is that which moves our inner being. That which moves our inner being. Jesus' compassion. Jesus' compassion was not a thought, but it was an actual feeling deep in his inner man. And it's amazing. You know why it's amazing? Because he's saying it to Gentiles. The only time he says, I feel your pain. I feel for you. I have compassion for you. I feel compassion for you. Is said to Gentiles. God who has never felt pain, sorrow, or loss. Again, Jesus becomes the touchstone. I think, again, that's hard for us to understand. I have a hard time getting my my head around it, and I've thought about it a lot. The fact that God created us with these abilities to feel pain, to feel sorrow, to feel loss, but those were feelings we were never meant to have, but yet God endued us with them, and they may reside in God because we're made in His image, but God has never felt pain. How can the holy God feel pain? How, how can that? So we, we realize again, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't just, it, it is almost as simplistic to say the reason Jesus died is to save us from our sins. It is a correct answer, but it's a simplistic answer and there's much more to it. You all know that. There's a fact of our very holiness and the change of our nature and how we operate in a kingdom and so on. Well, it's just about as simplistic Um, to say that Jesus became man so he could die. That's absolutely right. That's absolutely true. Jesus became a human being so that he could die on our behalf. But it leaves it 
a lot unsaid. Because what Jesus also came to do was to experience what we experience. That's why the book of Hebrews says we have a faithful high priest that cannot, or that, that, that he's not such a high priest that he cannot be touched by the feelings of our infirmities. So you have to understand, it's back to this, you know, God gave me this, gosh, how, how long has it been, gang? Probably a couple of years ago that we talked about Jesus being the touchstone, that we touch God through, when we touch Jesus, we're touching God the Father. When God, when Jesus touch us, touches us, God the Father is touching us. He is the touchstone through which God operates. That's why the Bible can say that God the Father was in Christ Jesus, crucifying the world to himself because what Jesus feels, the Father was able to feel. Because Jesus is the touchstone in both directions. So we find then that, uh, that it's, be, you know, that's why again Hebrews tells us we have a great high priest who, cannot, who can be touched by the feelings of our affirmities. And, uh, but Father, but one thing we don't want to say is that Father doesn't have compassion. Father, God has always had compassion. It's always been recorded in Scripture that He has compassion. I just want to change a, um, uh, I wrote some extra notes in here. I'm trying to have a hard time. I wrote them so fast. Well, one of, the, one of the, the things that the Spirit gave me, and it didn't make sense when he first said it, was, wouldn't it be a shame if the only thing Jesus did was visit hospitals? Think about that a minute. Wouldn't it be a terrible thing if the only thing Jesus did was visit hospitals? You see, if all Jesus did was came and visit, he could see a situation, he could see something, but it's not him having the issue, it's not him having the problem. He, he might have compassion on it, but he's just visiting and leaving. Whereas our God is so good that one of the reasons Jesus came was not just to die, but to really know what we go through, what it is like to be a human being. He doesn't just visit the hospital. He, he becomes a patient with us, if you will. And you know, if you ever thought about what we're talking about here is the compassion of God, the love of God. Do you realize how unique that is in all of human history? There are thousands of gods. There's thousands of idols and different things that people to this day still worship. And I, I hope this makes sense to you. I've, it, it struck me. There was a, a guy. Uh, I probably should remember his name and I don't. He came out of Navy SEALs and he was being interviewed on uh, Fox television a couple of years ago. It may have been the guy at one time, the guy that shot Bin Laden. I mean, you kind of saw him in some of these interviews, young man that came out of the Delta Force or whatever it is. But he made an amazing statement. He said, and I'm, trying to, I'm paraphrasing this to get to the point. He said, basically, he said, we should be very proud of the fact that America is good. He said, if you really understand, he said, few people, few people really understand the resources that we have in our military. They're not talked about, they're not bragged about, they're not put on display, but they're there. This is what he was saying. He said, we have things that people can't even imagine. He said, I'll tell you this, it's a good thing that we are good people. Let that sink in a minute. It's a good thing we are good people because we have immense power. More so than we talk about, more so than we let people know there are things that we have. Dave, would you say it's probably true? Yeah. That there are things that, are, that, that this nation is capable of. And if his point was, imagine if we were a bad people. Imagine if we had wicked ways and our ways were wicked. You know, you let that sink in. How wonderful it is that this all-powerful God is love and not hate. What if the Bible said God is hate and vengeance? And you know what? For a lot of people in the false gods that they had, that's exactly what they did. You look at some of the things that we call mythology that to them was truth, that God's fighting with each other, raping each other, different things, murdering each other, murdering children, and all these other things. And when you, when you took your sacrifice to that God, it was to get his appeasement, to make him happy, because you were never sure that he was really on your side. How wonderful it is, as we stop for a moment and consider this, Jesus says, I feel compassion. That's God, the almighty, all-powerful God. And I'll tell you what, isn't it a wonderful thing? As we say all the time, our God is good. All the time. All the time, God is good. Because the power he has, imagine if he wasn't. And so, wouldn't it be a shame if Jesus just visited hospitals rather than becoming a partaker of the things that we go through? So I, I grabbed a couple scriptures. Not that you necessarily have to see them, but they're going to talk about the compassion of God. This is from Psalm 78. It says, when he slew them, then they sought him. 
And they returned and sought diligently for God. That's when God brings judgment on his people. Then they remembered that God was their rock and the most high God, their redeemer. Nevertheless, they flattered him with their mouth and they lied to him with their tongue for their heart was not steadfast with him, nor were they faithful in his covenant. For he being full of compassion, there it is, for he being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity and did not destroy them. We can all say amen to that. For he, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity and did not destroy them. Yes, many a time he turned his anger away and did not stir up all his wrath. For he remembered that they were but flesh, a breath that passes away and does not come again. Thank God that's the God that we have. In Psalm 111 it says, The works of the Lord are great, studied by all who have pleasure in them. His work is honorable and glorious and his righteousness endures forever. He has made his wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. And one you're probably very familiar with from Lamentations. Though the Lord's mercies, through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. It is this ability to feel compassion that drives our study today. In the region of the Decapolis where Jesus was, he had healed all that were brought to him, including the man that had the speech impediment and the uh, deafness that we saw last week. As he moves closer to Jewish territory, the crowds begin to increase even more. So this is only 10 verses. I thought we'd just read it and then we'll break it down, talk about it, and then we'll have a day. It says, in those days, the multitude being very great and having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to them and said to them, and you're also going to see why I said about the hard-headedness of these disciples. He says, he called on his disciples to him and said to them, I feel compassion for the multitude because they have now been with me three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their own houses, they will faint on the way, for some of them have come from afar. Then his disciples answered him, how can one satisfy these people with bread here in the wilderness? Jesus, what are we going to do? Weeks after Bethsaida where he fed 120 to 150,000 people and they watched him do it. Now we got less people than that and the first thing they said, what are we going to do? Can you just imagine Jesus going, mm, 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 mm. For some of them have come from apart. Then his disciples answered him, how can one satisfy these people with bread here in the wilderness? He asked them, how many loaves do you have? And they said, seven. And he commanded the multitude to sit on the ground. And he took the seven loaves and gave thanks, broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And they set them before the multitude. And they had a few small fish. And have, having blessed them, he said to them, he set them also before them. So they ate and were filled. And they took up seven large baskets of leftover fragments. Now those who had eaten were about 4,000. And he sent them away. And immediately he got into the boat with his disciples and came to the region of Dalmanutha. That's the whole story. And even though Jesus was using this trip to continue the education of the twelve, he was still healing the sick, casting out demons, and he was preaching the kingdom. We can't forget that in the midst of all that, everything he was doing, he was still preaching the kingdom. So the Gentile crowds continue to grow, and even though they have had nothing to eat, they don't want to leave. You think about that. How amazing must have been the atmosphere around Jesus' ministry. Jesus says these people have been with him nonstop for three days. Imagine going to church on Sunday morning and still being there Wednesday. Because you just didn't want to leave because of the atmosphere that was there. The multitude is proof of what Jesus said at the beginning of his ministry. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. God told the prophet Amos that a time was coming that he would send a famine into the land. Not a famine of bread, but he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine in, on the land. Not a famine of bread, nor of thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea, and from north to east. They shall run to and fro, seeking the word of God, Lord of the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. This is why the crowds didn't leave. They were hungry for the word of God. Not the traditions of men, not the worship of dumb idols. Uh, in Israel and outside of Israel, all were um, astonished by his teaching. Remember he said, he teaches like no man ever taught. No man spoke like this man. Jesus fed them spiritually, but he also fed them physically, since both touched the heart of his compassion. So Jesus says, 
I feel compassion on the multitude because they've now been with me these three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their own houses, they will faint along the way for some of them have come from afar. Then the disciples asked him this odd question. Then his disciples answered him, how can one satisfy these people with bread in the wilderness? How in the world could they ask this question? I said, sometimes they just don't seem like the sharpest tools in the box. How could they ask this question having witnessed an almost identical situation just a few months ago at Bethsaida? Bethsaida, uh, Bethsaida where better than 25,000 people had been fed. You hear this question and you just want to shake your head. What's going on here? Perhaps they were simply acknowledging that as before there is no humanly, way, uh, humanly speaking that they could do anything under these circumstances. They are all in the wilderness and this time they don't even suggest the idea of a blank check and a grocery store like they did before. There is no place to even go and get groceries if you wanted them. Maybe this was to say, Master, if you don't, we can't. Or perhaps there was something else at play here. At Bethsaida, the multitude was Jewish. Here they are Gentiles. Just a short time ago, this is what they could have said to Jesus. Just a short time ago, Jesus, when that Syrophoenician woman came to us, wanting you to heal their daughter, you said that you were sent to Israel first. And you told her that it wasn't right to give the children's bread to dogs. Well, this whole multitude is dogs. This whole multitude is defiled. That is how they thought. The disciples have a problem. They know Jesus has the power, but does he have the will? They don't have the resources to feed 4,000 plus on top of it. They're not worthy. Jesus asked them, how many loaves do you have? And they said, seven. He says, don't tell me what we don't have. Tell me what I've got to work with. They told him seven loaves and a few small fishes. And now Jesus begins to move. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves and gave thanks, broke it, gave it to to his disciples to set before them. And they set it before the multitude. Jesus again, like before, makes the people sit down. He brings order to chaos. And you can imagine when all those people sit down. Now they said there's 4,000. And this one they believe is probably about 15,000 with women and children. Gets them all to sit down. And just for a moment, just for a moment, there's probably a hush that came over everybody. What's going to happen now? to where they could probably hear him pray. And Jesus prays, and he breaks the bread. He thanks his Father for all that they have. He breaks the bread, and the disciples serve the crowd. And then they have, then they have, and they, they has? I gotta go back to school. And they has a few small fish, and having blessed them, he said to them, he set them also before them. Just like at Bethsaida, there is another creative miracle. I'm going to make a point here that maybe you've never thought about. Maybe you have wondered about it. I've always wondered about it. Do you ever imagine when we get to heaven, you know, how many of you think we're going to eat in heaven? Come on, do you think we're going to eat in heaven? But is some animal going to have to die to feed us? How do, how do you come to... See, do we understand that when Jesus is feeding all these people, He is feeding them from grain that was never grown, and He's serving them fish that were never born and never died? Ever considered that? He didn't, he didn't bring those fish magically from the Sea of Galilee and set them there. He didn't have bakers over here baking for a, a month ahead of time to have all this bread ready. It's a creative miracle. And I think that answers what's going to be like in heaven. In heaven, you can probably have a T-bone steak, but no cow had to die for you to have it. You can eat all the fish you want, and no fish has to die for you to have it. I think this answers that question of how we're going to operate. And, you know, when Jesus, uh, before his ascension, is, he's on the shore of Galilee and he's fixing, remember, he's, he's cooking fish for them and they all ate of it together. No fish died. He didn't go fishing. He just made it there. So anyway, that's a small thing, but I don't know if you've, I've always wondered about it. How, because I know there's animals in heaven. The Bible tells us so. You know, except for one of our dogs that's in hell. But... The, <laughs> And we got a cat that I think is close to getting there. But anyway, pray for her. 
Anyway, I just thought that was interesting. The food is served and immediately restored as the creative miracle repeats itself. Notice that Jesus never asks anyone from the crowd, anyone from the resting flock, to help distribute the food. He makes it clear that it is the apostles' responsibility to feed the flock, both Jew and Gentile. They will spiritually feed both in the Great Commission. And finally... As we get to the end, so they ate and were filled. And again, that's the same Greek word used in Bethsaida, that they were filled, they were stuffed, they were gorged, they couldn't eat another bite. And they took up seven large baskets of leftovers. Again, as at Bethsaida, the multitude is gorged until they can't eat anymore. They can't even eat another bite. Leftovers are gathered, only this time it wasn't in 12 small lunch baskets, but the leftovers filled seven large baskets. If you don't think these baskets are large, when the Bible says that Paul was in Damascus and had to flee for his life and they let him down outside the city walls in a basket, it's the same word. These are baskets big enough to fit a man and they've got seven of them. In my own opinion... This was Jesus teaching the twelve that when they make feeding God's flock their priority, God will make sure there's enough left over to meet all their needs. And finally, the last verse we'll look at. Now those who had eaten were about 4,000, and he sent them away. Add the women and children, and we're talking around 15,000 people, not a small miracle to bless the Gentiles. So he had a lot to, to say in this last miracle. The last great miracle that he will do amongst the Gentiles. The last time that he will minister to the Gentiles in front of these 12 men. But hopefully now they have gotten the point of what God's will is. Because on these people, I feel compassion. Lessons taught. Lessons learned. Just what we discussed earlier. Culture. Traditions. Patterns of belief. Or we could say strongholds, thoughts, and imaginations don't change overnight. This story is not only a display of Jesus' love and compassion for the Gentiles, but it's also a compassion that is not one bit different that he showed to the Jews or the Gentiles. And it shows that his compassion and his patience in training these 12 men. He brings truth into their lives and then consistently reinforces it as he does all of us. It takes time, but with love and determination strongholds, thoughts, and imaginations can be tore down. Jesus is that gentle and patient with us. Will we be that gentle and patient with others that we are working with, discipling, talking to? Will I remember to be, there's times when I want to choke my cousin because he just doesn't get it. He doesn't see the consistency of Scripture. He just wants to say, can't you see this? It's right there, black. You know, you get frustrated. But Jesus didn't get frustrated. He kept giving them truth and reinforcing it, giving them truth and reinforcing it. And so will we be as patient with ourselves sometimes? And will we be as as patient with others as he has been? Because strongholds take a long time to tear down. And we have to remember that. That's what's so frustrating for me at the prison because I never know if I'm going to see those guys again. If I knew I had them for a year, I could set up a syllabus that would take them through a systematic theology. But sometimes you only have them for a week and what do you say when this may be the only time you get to talk to them? So I hope that we'll all, I mean, it makes me understand just how patient God is with me. You know, after 30 years of this, you think I know a lot. I don't feel like I know a lot. If he doesn't teach me, I don't know anything. You know, I need him. I need him to be truth to me. I need him to be wisdom with me. And I need him to be awful patient with me. But he expects that of us towards others, to be patient with one another. So when you get fed up with some of your family and friends and wonder sometimes why they won't listen, and we all have that. Be patient, keep, in, keep bringing truth, keep enforcing it, but understand how patient God's been with us. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. What a wonderful teaching lesson, both for those 12 men and for us, that, Lord, we, we have all been recipients of your patience and grace. Lord Jesus, you extended that, because by the time I was done with this lesson, I was ready to write these guys off. I mean, I know they made it. I know the end of the story. I know their successes. I know they they wrote the beautiful word of God that has gone all throughout the world and sustained the church for 2,000 years. But, Lord, there's times you just get exasperated and say, how could you guys even ask what to do in this situation? How could you offend God by doubting him after all that he's done? And yet it all makes sense when you look at it because it was a challenging traditions and strongholds and imaginations and thoughts that didn't go away overnight. 
But Lord Jesus, you were so patient. So patient that you even sent your spirit afterwards to continue the teaching, to continue reinforcing truth. You don't leave us spiritless. You don't leave us teacherless. You don't leave us the one who can change our hearts. We're grateful. We're grateful. So Lord, thank you for all your blessings. Thank you for this coming week. Thank you for what you will do in this week, Lord God. And every day we present ourselves to you holy in Jesus' name for you to use us for your kingdom. And Lord, again, thank you for how patient you have been with us and how patient we can be with others. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week, beloved.